Good afternoon. My name is Dan Marzano, UBA Senior Manager of Strategic Solutions. On behalf of United Benefit Advisors and CXC Solutions, I welcome you to today's presentation in the UBA Employee Benefits Webinar Series. Today's topic is a Health Plan's Guide to the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Our presenter today is Stephen Wynn, Senior Product Manager at CXC Solutions. Stephen is a subject matter expert in the area of benefits compliance. Since the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, Stephen and his team perform NQTL comparative analysis for plan sponsors and TPAs. His previous experience involves a broad range of compliance subjects, including non-discrimination testing, ERISA, and ACA compliance. Stephen, the floor is yours. Right, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Um, so we are here to talk about uh, the, the CAA, um, a couple of pretty important uh, aspects of it. Um, you know, a little bit more about me. Um, we have been performing these uh, NQTL analyses and, uh, and you know, other uh, you know, MAPIA related um, uh, items for, uh, for the last couple of years now, um, since the passage of the CAA. Um, so obviously the CAA covers uh, you know, a great deal of ground, um, implemented a great deal of new requirements for plan sponsors. Um, and we're going to talk about two of them uh, very specifically today. Um, and so, uh, and those two topics are RxDC reporting and mental health parity uh, and NQTL analysis. Um, so this is two new requirements that are being put on plan sponsors um, and their, their issuers uh, that we're going to go into uh, a little more uh, detail about both of those two topics today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, what the process is, what the requirements are, who is required to do this. Um, and also some of the, uh, you know, discuss some of the, uh, the practical implications of this. Um, you know, these are uh, obviously pretty onerous uh, and complicated requirements. They're very different requirements uh, between the two. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll try and talk about them in as much detail um, and kind of give you a um, you know a, a high level view of of what this is, what is going to be required, um, and uh, and you know what what the implications are for for your plans. So we're going to start with RxDC reporting. Uh, so this is a new requirement, um, specific uh, uh, information that needs to be submitted to the Department of Labor um, on an annual basis. And so um, it is, as the name suggests, uh, it is related to prescription drugs, but it does not only prescription drugs. Um, so, you know, the overarching requirement, um, you know, where the, the CAA is requiring insurance companies and uh, group health plans, um, employer sponsored health plans to submit certain information about spending on prescription drugs uh, and healthcare services, uh, prescription drugs that account for the most spending, uh, the most frequently prescribed. Um, any uh, prescription drug rebates from the manufacturers, um, as well as premiums and cost sharing. Um, and so this, this uh, gets into a lot of very specific details. Um, we'll talk about the process for what is submitted and how it is submitted. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is required of insurance companies and the health plans themselves. Um, so this is a, a requirement that is falling on the employer, but is something that the, the issuers, uh, the carriers and the PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, um, are, are able to do on behalf of the employer. Um, and so whether your uh, you know, carrier or PBM will, will do this, um, it, it depends uh, on, on the carrier and what their process is. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it is going to be the plan's responsibility to make sure this is being filed. And if the, the carrier or the, the PBM are not submitting this information on behalf of the plan, uh, that the plan is taking care of that. Um, and so the, you know, looking at kind of, um, you know, the, the high level view of this, um, you know, the, the annual deadline for this reporting is going to be June 1st of every year. Uh, this was, you know, the first year where it was it's the last two years that it's been required. Um, and so it's, um, you know, the, this is something that has to be submitted through electronically through the, the HIOS portal. Um, and so this is an online portal um, where, where the plan or the issuer on behalf can submit um, this information. 
Um, it is a combination of certain data files. We'll talk about what those entail. Um, you know, it's basically a, a plan lists, data files, and then a narrative response are the three kind of legs of this that need to be submitted through that portal. Um, and so, as I've mentioned, service providers such as PBMs and carriers can submit this on behalf of the plans, but they are not required to do so. And that's very important. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, carriers and PBMs have generally taken the position that um, they would prefer to submit this um, you know, to the DOL as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, providing it to all of their, their employers, uh, the clients that they work with. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the major carriers and PBMs are submitting this on behalf of the plan. Um, and so, but not in all cases. And so, obviously, if the plan needs to submit this on their own behalf, um, they're going to need to request and obtain a great deal of information from those service providers. Um, we'll talk about kind of the, the specific information that uh, that is requested during that process. Um, but it all kind of boils down to a, um, a set of files that needs to be submitted um, to this, this portal on an annual basis for the plan. So let's uh, start by talking about, you know, who is you know, required to submit this information. Um, you know, health insurance issuers are, are required to submit certain information on their behalf, and they can also submit it on behalf of the individual plans uh, that they that they administer and that they are the carriers for. Um, and so this includes both uh, fully insured and self-funded health plans, um, non-federal government plans such as, um, you know, municipalities, school districts, um, all have to file this as well, church plans as well, um, FBHB plans, uh, this is a federal employee health benefits plans. Um, in terms of plans that are not required uh, to do this reporting, uh, account-based plans such as HRAs, um, accepted benefit plans, um, specifically Medicare Advantage and Part D plans, Medicaid plans, state CHIP program, um, retiree-only plans, that one uh, may, may come in handy or uh, may be useful knowledge to you, and plans may, may maintained outside of uh, the U.S. for what we call non-resident aliens, uh, those that are not U.S. residents. Um, and it's a plan for um, you know, residents of other countries that work for those uh, those U.S. potentially work for those U.S. based entities. Um, if there's no you know U.S. based individuals um, associated with that plan, subscribe to that plan. Um, it's it's not required to submit either, and that's a similar concept to some other compliance areas that we work in. So let's talk a little bit about what is submitted as part of this process. Um, so uh, the the first set uh, of items is our, our plan lists. Um, and so, you know, if we have individual or student market plans, um, you know, we need to submit a list of those plans. But, um, you know, for, for you know, employer-based health plans, uh, they'll need to submit a list of the plans that they offer. Um, and so that'll be a list of not only the individual, you know, medical plans and the pharmacy plans, um, but, um, you know, any differences, uh, you know, any separate carriers that you have, um, you know, it's, it's going to include all of the plans that are offered uh, by the employer um, as a list in a very specific format. Um, and, you know, just to, um, you know, to go over something I, I forgot to mention is that um, all uh, of these files are in Excel format for the plan list and the data data files. The narrative response, which we'll talk about next, is in a, is in a Word document or PDF format. Uh, but all of these are, um, are Excel or CSV specifically files um, that, uh, that there are templates for that you can download from the CMS website. Um, and so the, the plan list, uh, depending on the types of plans that are being offered by the entity, um, and then the individual data files. Uh, so there are you know, eight different types of data files uh, that, that need to be submitted. Um, you know, and they are, have templates for each of these individual files. Um, so it's going to include some, uh, you know, premium information, um, you know, spending information. Um, and then, you know, that's going to be overall medical plan information. Um, so that's that's important from the standpoint of it's not just the PBM, uh, the pharmacy uh pharmacy benefit manager that uh, that needs to be, um, you know, to, that, that needs to submit this. Um, it's, you know, also your your carrier, your TPA for your medical plan. So if you're working with uh, with an Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, they're going to either need to give you information to submit this or um, submit this on your behalf. Um, but uh, D3 through D8 is where we get into the specific prescription drug information. 
Um, so the top 50 most frequent, uh, frequently uh, prescribed brand drugs, the top 50 most costly drugs, uh, the top 50 drugs by, by spending increase, um, you know, the, the total RX spending, and then, uh, you know, uh, sheets for, for uh, rebates. Um, you know, rebates by therapeutic class and uh, any rebates for the top 25 drugs. So this is uh, very, very specific information. Obviously, the plan isn't going to have this readily available to you. And so if the, you know, if you're, the PBM for the plan is not, not submitting this information on the plan's behalf, uh, there's a lot of information that is going to need to be gathered by the plan in order to submit this. Um, but uh, you know, typically how this is is being handled for for most of these data items is that uh, any information that needs to come from the employer, um, the PBM or the carriers are requesting from the employer um, to get what what else they need that is plan specific, and then submitting all of this information on the plan's behalf. Uh, but it is up to the, the plan to um, to make sure that that is being done. The, the third leg of this is the, uh, the narrative response. Um, and so this is a kind of a custom written response that needs to be submitted um, for, the, you know, for, for each filing. And um, it addresses some of the, the methods used. Um, and so um, you know, there's specific items that need to be addressed in that narrative response. Um, the, the net payments from federal or state reinsurance or cost sharing programs. Um, so that kind of, uh, you know, we, we don't want to, they, they want to see every, every bit of that, both the actual cost of the drug, uh, but they don't want, they want to see what those rebates are, those costs sharing with federal and state programs, et cetera, um, to see what the actual cost is. Um, any drugs missing from the CMS crosswalk? Uh, so this is part of the process as well, is that there is what they call a crosswalk for um, all the, the different drugs that they, they look at. Um, it's a pretty extensive Excel database uh, that you can download online as well. Um, and so it's uh, you know lists of of the drugs, their drug names, their RxDC codes, um, and basically the uh, the uh, the exact information that needs to that how those drugs need to be referred to within uh, your data submission. Um, but there you know maybe and will be drugs that are not on the CMS crosswalk. Um, so any drugs uh, in, you know, that, that need to be reported um, that are, are missing from that CMS crosswalk uh, will need to be described in that narrative response as well. Um, and, uh, and again, any um, you know, prescription drug rebates, um, descriptions of, of how those work, where they're coming from, um, allocation methods for those prescription drug rebates and the impact of those prescription drug rebates. Um, it's, you know, it's somewhat open to interpretation. Um, but there, you know, there are some, um, uh, there's a, a pretty extensive document uh, available publicly um, of instructions for for how to do this and what to to include in that narrative response. Um, and so, obviously, for for issuers and carriers who are doing this on on behalf of their clients, uh, we'll be submitting kind of a static, uh, generic narrative response. Um, and so, but but clients will need to put together this narrative response. Employers will need to put together this narrative response. Um, in, in specific cases where, where those entities are not filing it. And so with regards to the, the submission, um, you know, as I've mentioned, all of this information is submitted through the RxDC module in the uh, HIOS system, Health Insurance Oversight System. Um, so it's a, a CMS portal. Um, the, uh, it's a pretty simple hyperlink and easy to find through, uh, through a simple Google search as well. Um, yeah, in order to submit this, um, an account must be created. And what we can say from, from personal experience is that, that this um, takes a great deal of time. Um, the, uh, this process runs very slowly um, you know, for, for us as an entity uh, to submit these filings on behalf of clients. We created uh, an account for ourselves or uh, requested for an account to be created. And it took several months. Uh, before we we actually uh, were given our credentials, uh, despite we were following up with them very regularly every once a week, I believe, for that entire stretch. Um, and they kept telling us the same thing, that it's in and waiting and will be created soon. And this was relatively close to, to the first deadline. And so, um, you know, that's just kind of a, a cautionary tale. Um, for the most part of, um, you know, if you're you're going to be submitting this, um, obviously you need to to get well ahead of this. Um, you know the that June deadline 
um, is going to sneak up on you every year. And so, um, you know, definitely need to uh, make sure and create these accounts and, and, you know, get familiar with these systems well ahead of time, because uh, you don't know really how long this is going to take. Um, and so, you know, by, by January or February, um, you know, we recommend uh, to, to plans to be very proactive um, about, about a number of different things, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, so, you know, with regards to overall implications, um, you know, there is, you know, as I've mentioned, a lot of large carriers and PBMs are going to be submitting this on behalf of clients, but, uh, you know, the, the plans uh, and brokers on their behalf need to be uh, very, um, uh, very diligent about this um, and, and get very proactive about it. Um, you know, if you haven't gotten, uh, if you haven't received anything from your carriers or your PBMs about submission or, or surveys, um, you know, need to make sure and reach out to them to to inquire when those are going to go out. Um, you know, a typical process that we've seen from from the large carriers is that they'll send out a survey to to all of their employers and say you have a week, two weeks, how a pretty short time frame to submit this information. And if you don't submit the the employer specific information that they need from you in time, they are saying that. You, it's then going to be the responsibility of the plan to submit it on its own behalf. Um, so making sure that you know when those those surveys are going to go out, uh, making sure that you know when those deadlines are going to be so that those things are getting done on time so that that requirement doesn't ultimately fall on you. Um, that's a very important uh, consideration as well. Um, Want to be proactive with all of the, the service providers that are involved in this um, and, and make sure that if, and obviously if they're not doing it, um, you know, the plan is going to be responsible for doing it as well, and we'll need to get a process in place for, for accomplishing that. So um, that's, that covers the, the RxDC portion of this. Um, obviously, uh, you're, you're welcome to submit any questions on RxDC um, uh, to the, uh, the Q&A um, or the, uh, the chat. Um, and we'll be answering all of those questions at the the end of the webinar. Um, and so we'll uh, we'll probably leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the, the second um, aspect of this, which is our mental health parity um, aspect of the CAA. And so with mental health parity specifically, um, you know, MAPIA, as we call it, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act has been in place for some time. It was, uh, it was passed in 2008. And basically what it stated is that uh, the way a group health plan treats mental health and substance use disorder benefits has to be in parity with the way it treats medical surgical benefits. Um, so this applies to uh, a number of different categories, financial requirements, such as co-payments and co-insurance, uh, things like that. Um, there are specific criteria and thresholds we need to meet um, for those, as well as quantitative treatment limitations, any numerical limits on the number of visits, number of treatments within a given period, et cetera and non-quantitative treatment limitations or NQTLs, which is a, an acronym we've, uh, we've been hearing so far today. And, um, and, and NQTLs are really anything that can be used to limit treatment on a non-quantitative basis. So utilization management, prior authorization, uh, things of that nature um, are, are all uh, covered by non-quantitative treatment limitations. And so MAPIA you know, put these parity rules into place but there wasn't much of an enforcement mechanism um, and there wasn't any affirmative require there wasn't any requirement for the plans to demonstrate compliance. Um, and so what the CA what they did with the CAA, which was passed in late 2020, um, is that it requires plans to perform and document comparative analyses of the design and applications of the NQTLs that apply to the plan. Um, so that includes all, you know, specific plan terms regarding those NQTLs, descriptions of the benefits um, to which those NQTLs apply. Uh, so what is subject to prior authorization? Um, what is available in network or is out of network? Those are some questions that we want to ask. Um, the factors used to apply the NQTLs. Uh, so what factors and criteria are being used to uh, make prior authorization determinations? Um, you know, and uh, how are they applied to mental health and medical surgical? Are they more stringently applied to mental health than medical surgical? The evidentiary standards used for the factors. Uh, so whatever benchmarks are being used 
um, in that process need to be stated and analyzed as well. And then ultimately, uh, what they're looking for in the bottom line is a comparative analysis demonstrating that those factors and sources and evidentiary standards are no more stringently applied to the mental health than they are to the medical surgical. Um, these need to be these analyses need to be very detailed and specific. Um, reasoned discussions of those NQTLs, how they apply, what they apply to, um, and and conclusions of whether those are are compliant or not. And so. This, unlike RxDC, isn't something that needs to be submitted to uh, the departments um, uh, every on an annual basis. It needs to be uh, it needs to be performed and kept on file in case the departments request it. Um, and so the DOL can um, initiate a, a random investigation. They have been doing random investigations of both plans and carriers um, for 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 many years now. Um, it could also be triggered potentially by an employee complaint. Um, and so if a participant in the plan, it can also request this analysis and it needs to be provided to them. If they request it and it's not provided to them, they can complain to uh, to the Department of Labor, for example, um, and, and that could initiate an investigation as well. Um, one thing I can tell you about investigations is once those investigations are initiated, they typically give the plan between 14 and 30 days to respond, uh, to provide that analysis. Obviously, this is a very complicated analysis that needs to be performed and is, is virtually impossible to do in 14 to 30 days. And so that's why plans need to be proactive about this. Um, and the other reason is because there are potential consequences of noncompliance with this. Um, so, you know, let's say we, we've gone through the process and we've uh, submitted our, the DOL has, uh, has initiated an investigation, sent us a nasty letter, and we've uh, responded with our analyses and they, you know, look at everything and say, well, the plan is, is non-compliant in this way. Um, the plan is going to be given an, an, another 45 days from that initial determination in order to bring the plan into compliance. Um, if the plan is still not compliant, the plan must notify all of the enrolled individuals, all the participants of the plan of that non-compliance. So you get to send a notice out to all the participants of the plan saying we are not complying with federal law that could um, you know, spur uh, participants to, uh, to sue the plan. Um, and so, um, you know, and likewise, as well as, um, you know, informing all of the, the participants in the plan, um, those findings will also be shared with the state where the plan is located. Um, so individual states, we're, we're really talking about a federal requirement here, but you should know that individual states all have their own set of rules and some of them have their own parity laws um, and specific uh, penalties that might apply um, to parity violations. And so, you know, the, uh, the departments can inform the state, which could initiate a state level investigation and potential penalties there. But really, you know, obviously being sued by your participants is, uh, is a big reason to, to avoid noncompliance here. Um, but one of the, the biggest reasons and something that is, um, you know, a, a penalty and everything but name is the potential for re-adjudication of claims. Um, so the, the departments have the authority to, um, you know, if they investigate the plan and determine, you know, that the plan is non-compliant, they can go back and make the plan re-adjudicate denied claims from, uh, from prior periods. Um, and so that could be extremely costly to the plan uh, for the primary reason that, you know, particularly for these self-funded plans, um, that depend on stop loss insurance. Um, stop loss isn't going to cover those claims from previous periods. That those contracts are very specific to what they cover and within what period they cover. And the DOL re-adjudicating claims for this reason is generally not going to be covered. So the plan could ultimately be on the hook for re-adjudicated claims, um, which you know, as I've mentioned, is uh, you know, since the people people tend to shrug this off because there's no official penalty. Um, like there is on ACA, but if this isn't a penalty, I don't know what is uh, personally. Um, this could be potentially very, very costly to the plan um, if it if it got to this point. So, um, you know, some of the recent developments, uh, you know, as when, once the CAA went into effect, um, the you know they they had a pretty quick turnaround on the deadline for completing that analysis. I think they put it in February, uh, sometime early February of 2021. This analysis need to be completed for for basically every plan across the country, um, or at least most of them. And so um, obviously, um, and not very very few, if any, plans were proactive about this um, for and during that time. Uh, everyone was still trying to figure out what to do and what all of this meant. 
Um, and so, um, you know, as we got into, uh, you know, once we got into 2022, um, the, the departments released their, their first post CAA report to Congress, um, which is issued by the departments of labor, treasury and HHS. They all collectively are responsible for enforcement of this. Um, and it's kind of goes through all of their enforcement efforts, how many plans they investigated, what they typically found, some of the issues they were running into, um, and based on their first round of investigations in 2021, uh, post CAA. And, uh, the, the key sentence, the headline of that report was that none of the comparative analyses reviewed to date have contained sufficient information upon initial receipt. So of all the plans they investigated, I think there was probably about 170 something in uh, in 2021 um, that they that they talked about in their in their report. Um, so all of the analyses that they looked at from all the different carriers, geographic locations, different types of clients, um, big and small, none of them had a sufficient comparative analysis. So that that tells us a few things. Obviously, the the guidance was very vague, uh, open to interpretation, and a lot of folks were having trouble figuring out what to do. Um, all of the major carriers were were um, you know not uh, declining to perform these these analyses, um, and so you know ultimately the the clients that got investigated very early on, the the employers that got investigated very early on, uh, found themselves in a pretty awkward situation. Uh, but uh, they were seeing the same thing across the board that no one was quite complying with this. And so um, they listed out, um, you know, a, a number of things, a number of common reasons for insufficiency, a lot of obvious things like no meaningful analysis, uh, didn't have supporting information to back up their analysis, just gave us conclusions, um, just gave us a lot of information with no conclusions. Um, it really has to be kind of a, a little research project where you, um, you know, pull in all of that information, put it into, uh, you know, a narrative, a conclusion. And and cite your work, cite your sources, um, you know, show your work uh, is the is the, the phrase I was looking for there. Um, but um, so they weren't weren't seeing it in in the 2021 investigations. And so um, you know, proceeding into 2023, um, looking at all of the 2022 investigations, um, you know, there's uh, they they said they still have not received as of the end of 2022 a satisfactory comparative analysis upon the first request. Um, that they always needed to go back and get some additional information. Um, they they also you know talk a lot about how the enforcement is very time consuming and that they need uh, more resources um, in order to enforce this. Um, and so um, you know one of the one of the kind of important things that uh, that, that I thought was important from that report um, was that they started they initiated fewer new investigations in 2022 than they did in 2021. You would think they would increase um, as they you know, got, got more efficient with this. But what we were seeing was that so many of the 2021 investigations kind of slopped over into 2022 were still open and still ongoing that they weren't, they didn't have the resources necessary to open as many new investigations in 2022 as they did in 2021. And so um, so that's, that's interesting to note. Um, they're definitely part of the, you know, what this report is doing is asking Congress for more resources and more enforcement authority um, in order to comply with this. And, you know, it's, uh, I am always hesitant to try and uh, predict what, what Congress is going to do. We have a hard enough time trying to predict what the departments are going to do. But um, from what we've seen, there's, there's just a lot of momentum moving towards this, uh, more enforcement, more strict, stringent rules um, being, being applied. Um, and one of the other items within that report to Congress uh, that came out very recently um, was that they are taking what I would call a name and shame approach, um, which we found very interesting. I was warned by a, a deep, former DOL investigator that, uh, that I've worked with um, that this was coming, and she was dead on, um, was that they were going to name specific entities that are not complying with this and call them out, and they did exactly that. Um, so there were uh, three different plan sponsors. Um, it went through not only, you know, listed out, listed each uh, employer by name, by EIN, by number of employees, and went through a narrative about how they were non-compliant, all the different ways they weren't cooperating or weren't compliant, um, and really kind of uh, put them on blast, for lack of a better term. Um, so three different plan sponsors and three different carriers as well, large carriers. Um, were, um, were were given the same treatment. 
Um, and so they they definitely are. And you know, one of the you know things to note there is that the, of the three plans that they they looked at, um, two of them were on the slightly larger side. One of them was on the slightly smaller side. Um, and so you know, being a smaller plan doesn't necessarily mean you're going to um, escape scrutiny. Um, and so they, I think they want to be clear in pushing that message, uh, obviously. Um, but uh, the name and shame approach is something that uh, that they can take. And so that could open them up to potential headaches with their their participants. Um, you know, for carriers, it could create an issue with uh, with employers and brokers that they work with. Um, and so so everyone you know definitely wants to stay off the list, the name and shame list. Uh, another good reason to be um, proactive about this. The 2023 report to Congress also gave us the first examples that we've seen of, of uh, the, the departments actually re-adjudicating claims. Uh, so we knew this was a possibility um, that we've been warning people about, but this gives us actual specific examples that they've given us of claims that had been denied that had to be re-adjudicated and that the, the plan had to pay. Um, and so that's that's something that's you know the biggest uh, biggest worry for the plans, um, you know, from a from a strict compliance standpoint. Um, and so um, now that we have that in writing, it's uh, it's definitely something that that's it's gotten everyone's attention. So the the other thing that came out uh, very recently, um, about really at the same time that those uh, that report, the most recent report to Congress came out, was a new proposed rule. Um, and so this is about a four hundred page rule um, that that does uh, expands upon these requirements and clarifies them um, in many different ways. Um, so one of obviously the big complaints from, from the industry, from the, the folks having to comply with this is how complicated it is, but also how um, unclear it is and how there is, um, you know, there aren't a lot of uh, concrete uh, thresholds to meet, um, um, criteria to meet, um, that it's all very open to interpretation. So this proposed rule is aiming to, to make this a little more concrete. And so it clarifies certain definitions. Uh, that is an important aspect of this. Um, you know, plans aren't required to use specific definitions for what constitutes you know, medical necessity and other NQTL related items like that. Um, and so this proposed rule would uh, you know, require plans to use you know, a specific definition, base it on, you know, base these determinations or con covered conditions um, based on, you know, the DSM or other, you know, uh, commonly used publicly available databases um, uh, to, to make that a little more uh, uniform across, across the industry. It also goes into some uh, additional data elements uh, that would comprise a, a compliant analysis. Um, so one of the, the concepts I want to explain here with the, with the time that I have left um, is that, you know, I mentioned that the financial requirements in QTL side of mental health parity is more objective. Uh, the NQTL side of things is more subjective. The, the reason financial requirements in QTLs are more objective is because we have been given a threshold to meet. If you have a copayment, for example, applying that you're applying to mental health and substance use disorder benefits within a certain classification, you have to that financial requirement has to apply to at least two thirds of the medical surgical benefits within that classification. The way we calculate that, we could spend a whole full hour on, on how to do those tests, but ultimately the concept is that you have to apply it to a specific amount of your medical surgical benefits in order to apply that to a mental health benefit at all. They're taking, the proposed rule takes the same approach, but applies it to NQTLs. So it basically states that if you're going to apply prior authorization or, uh, you know, these other utilization review items um, for pharmacy or step therapy, um, you know, things of that nature, all these different restrictions that, uh, that have been commonplace uh, for, for group health plans for a long time, um, you will only be able to apply them to mental health benefits if you're applying them to all of your, um, substantially all of your medical surgical benefits in that classification. So, you know, if you to, you know, if we know anything about about health plans, obviously only certain benefits are going to be subject to prior authorization. It's not going to meet that standard and therefore um, is you're not going to be able to apply prior authorization potentially to any mental health or substance use disorder benefit, um, which is, you know, could be uh, you know, could be a, a big change, obviously, for a lot of plans. 
Uh, but as I mentioned, this is a proposed rule that has not been finalized yet. Um, they go through a, a whole process here where they, uh, you know, put out this proposed rule. They go through a public comment period. They review all of those comments and then finalize the rule at some point. Um, and so we, you know, there's there's never any telling when it's going to be finalized or what is going to be finalized. Obviously, there will be some changes in the finalized regulations from the original proposed rule, presumably based on those public comments. Um, but what we've heard informally um, is that we do expect this proposed rule to be finalized um, and for all of those new, more um, onerous aspects to be to be finalized along with them. Those NQT, the, the substantially all um, uh, uh, concept is is most likely going to be applied um, to NQTLs in the final rule, um, and we we generally expect that sometime in early to mid 2024. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, that's just unofficial, uh, you know, from from what we've heard uh, through the grapevine. Um, but ultimately, um, that's that's kind of what we're expecting, and would uh, you know, kind of fits the uh, the facts as we know them. And so, um, so definitely going to be, you know, important to uh, to, to have an analysis on file um, for every plan, um, you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, that that whoever's performing this analysis is reviewing not only, you know, these reports to Congress, but those this new proposed rule as well. Um, and so, um, you know, the obviously it's a it's a pretty time consuming effort um, to, to perform this analysis. Um, and so. Um, you know, as well as uh, it's a, just as well as it's time consuming for the DOL to enforce it. Um, so definitely something you want to be proactive about, um, given the, you know, the short time frames that are available, um, you know, to 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 submit these analyses, um, how complicated they can be and uh, just uh, the time that it takes to perform them. Um, you know, some kind of, uh, I guess, some pro tips on on this uh, this particular topic. Um, you know, obviously, you know, self-funded plans are going to need to perform this themselves in, in almost every case. Um, your carrier or your, T, your, your uh, TPA uh, may have uh, an option for you um, that they'll, they will perform it at a cost. Um, you know, so, so that's something to look into as well. Um, obviously, there are vendors out there that perform this analysis as well as a service. Um, but, you know, definitely going to be um, you know, important to um, to figure out what is being done for your plans um, and to, to get that process started, because um, if, when, when self-funded plans have to, to perform this analysis, um, they're going to have to request a great deal of information from multiple entities, uh, kind of like RxDC. It's not just your carrier, it's your PBM as well. It's your, um, you know, any EAP um, that is affiliated with the plan. Um, you know, any kind of carve out behavioral health benefits, separate utilization management vendors are all going to have a hand in this and be, need to to provide um, a great deal of information. Um, and so definitely something to, to be proactive about. Um, I mentioned self-funded plans and how this impacts them. So I'd be remiss in not mentioning fully insured plans as well, uh, which many of you will, um, will be working with. Um, and so for fully insured plans specifically, um, it's the the carriers are typically going to take on the onus of doing this um it's still theoretically the plan's responsibility for this to have this analysis performed but ultimately what we're seeing is for fully insured plans the carriers the large carriers would much rather perform the analysis themselves than provide the data necessary to do so they'd rather keep that in-house wherever possible and so for fully insured plans what we generally recommend um, is to reach out to those carriers um, and make sure that that analysis has been performed and that it is provided to the plan. Um, a, a lot of carriers may come back and say, well, we, uh, this is our responsibility. You don't have to do anything, but uh, we, we don't have a report for you. We'll provide that if, you, uh, if you're investigated by the, the Department of Labor. Uh, that's we, that's a, a not a good approach. Um, we, you know, we think uh, clients should, employers generally should not be satisfied with that. Um, definitely, you know, press uh, those carriers to provide an analysis so that you have it on file, um, because, you know, the, the participant in the plan uh, may request it from the carrier, uh, may call Blue Cross Blue Shield and request that analysis, but they may request it from the plan as well. Um, and so, you know, from the, the HR uh, representative for, for, for the employer. 
Um, and so, you know, if that's the case, um, you know, the plan needs to, to have that available to be able to distribute it to them or at least to know where it is and be able to, to give it to, uh, to whoever requests it um, or, or point them in the right direction. Um, so definitely important while uh, fully insured plans may not have to perform this analysis, uh, the carriers are likely going to relieve them of that obligation. Um, it's still something to be proactive about, to be checking on, to make sure that there is something on file. So um, that brings us, we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule, that brings us to the, uh, the end of the session. Um, as I mentioned before, um, any questions that you have on anything that we've discussed, um, RxDC, MHP, any of those items, please feel free to, uh, to submit those. Um, and uh, I, will, I, I will go ahead and, and jump right into them. So we have, um, let me kind of read through this question and then I'll, uh, I'll dictate it and then uh, provide a response for you. So first question um, is that, uh, you know, from, uh, from uh, someone's research, uh, they see a sunset provision in place for, um, you know, for fully insured self-funded clients uh, plus worth 51 plus employees can no longer opt out of MAPIA. So this, this specific provision was specific to federal self-funded non-federal government entities. Um, and so this was, you know, I mentioned them kind of uh, at some point during the presentation, uh, this is primarily going to be municipalities, school districts. Um, they had on the rules available to them an opt-out provision to where they could affirmatively opt out of, of the mental health parity um, as long as they, they met certain requirements, they informed all of their participants, things of that nature. Um, and so uh, some a lot of times that was running up against um, a contradictory requirements at the state level that were kind of eliminating the possibility of that opt out within many states. Um, and so what's what is happening here and what is being sunsetted is that specific opt out provision for self funded non federal government plans. Um, and so that is going to be um, and I, I, I I need to get you the, the actual dates on those. I don't have them right in front of me. Um, but as of a certain date, um, you know, those those types of employers, those types of plans are not going to be able to opt out of MAPIA anymore and are going to have to comply uh, the same as all else, as everyone else. Um, so I hope that, that answered that question. Um, so let me proceed to the next one. Give me just a moment here. So what about discussions regarding the ABA inclusion under autism spectrum disorder within mental health benefits? Is this for part of the proposed changes um, following with the three-pronged test? Uh, we're suggesting our clients remove the annual limit if applicable uh, to the ABA benefit and at least moving in the direction of compliance uh, as defined under the rule. Um, so the, you know, the, the answer is, is yes. Um, you know, ABA therapy, um, autism spectrum disorder related benefits are all going to be going to be factors in this process. And so we have seen a lot of different uh, specific requirements um, for, you know, that are applied to ABA therapy and autism spectrum disorder. And we're going to we're ultimately going to need to remove a lot of those. Um, we'll see how plans adjust on the medical surgical side to, uh, to account for this proposed rule, um, but we do anticipate, you know, um, that, that all of the prior authorization and the uh, treatment plan requirements and all of the really specific requirements that are put on ABA therapy and autism spectrum disorder are going to fail these, these substantially all, um, all criteria once this proposed rule is enacted. And so, yeah, we definitely recommend moving in the direction of the rule. Um, you know, that's how you do that is kind of dependent on the plan. Um, but we, we generally expect that that proposed rule is going to be finalized with that concept in place. And so, um, yeah, ABA therapy, obviously, if you're excluding ABA therapy and autism spectrum disorder style benefits, you need to, to cut that out now. Um, you know, the you pr proposed rule or not. Um, that's that's going to run afoul of these rules. But if you're applying all of these specific NQTLs to it, that could become an even bigger problem once this proposed rule is passed. Um, so hopefully that's that answered that question as well. Thank you, Stephen, for your thought leadership and sharing your expertise. 
CXC Solutions is a valued UBA alliance and offers UBA partner firms and their clients ACA compliance solutions, including workforce tracking, play or pay tracking, reporting services, and non-discrimination testing. To learn more, contact your UBA partner firm. Thank you to all the UBA partner firm employees and their clients who joined us today. We look forward to you joining us for the next webinar.